So we come to our time for us to um, spend some time uh, listening from the Word of God. And uh, I'm going to again welcome uh, all of us. My name is Epson, and I'm, one, I'm, I'm, I'm the pastor here. I'm one of the pastors here. So, but all of us, we are leaders here, and we have councils, uh, you know, good leaders, and, and uh, we have brothers and sisters. So, so I'm going to welcome every one of us. We are in a family of God. We're growing together to learn. We're learning about God. Amazing things are happening, and uh, uh, please, please feel free to just to uh, just to just. I, I would I would ask us to open open up for what God has for you today. Okay, um, and I know that a lot of things happening and going on in our minds, but just open your minds just to receive what God has for you today, and I just ask God, would you speak to me, uh, and just bring life in my heart, uh, and just just refresh me. Uh, can you pray with me right now as I'm praying? Uh, for the word and, and uh, for, our, uh, for all of us, okay? So let us pray. Father, thank you for this time. And we just, we want to thank you, Father, because you are here. And right now, we need your word uh, to bring life. And we just want to understand, not just understand, but we want to do the words that you want us to have in our lives, God. And, uh, we ask that, God, if there is any barrier, if there is anything that keeps us from understanding your word, God, we pray that you would help us, God. Take away any distractions in our minds. Take away any disturbances, God, Father. We pray that you would, Lord, minister to our hearts, God, today. Thank you, God. We give our time and this time of listening to your word into your hands. Amen. 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 Um, so we will have time for reflections and communion at the end. Um, so, um, so stay back and stay in tune. We were talking about uh, the character, the characteristic, uh, characteristics of a disciple. Right, and, and last week we, we, we heard about uh, humility, right? <clears throat> humility, one of the character of a disciple. And today we're gonna learn about love. And I know for sure that we have, we know, for, we, we know so much about love. So many definitions, so many thinking and, uh, and without love it is impossible for us to do life, right? So we have lots of definitions and we have learned many things from the Bible as well. But today, let us turn our attention and our focus to learn about this character as disciples of Jesus Christ, uh, to learn about this love again, or at some point to remind ourselves, what does this love mean for us? And how do we practice this love to other, to other, all right? And, and, and where do we learn this, this love from? And who could be that example that actually then learning from him allows us to live this life of love, all right? So for that, it's really that, you know, this love really originates or this love really begins from God himself. Love, I'm gonna say, love is an indispensable character of God. Just like the holiness is a part of the character of God. God cannot be called God without the holiness. Now, God cannot be called God without love. And this love in the Bible is about agape love, unconditional love. Okay, it's sacrificial love. It's not fickle love. It's not inconsistent love. It's not transactional love, meaning that, okay, I love you, you know, if you give me this. All right? So agape love really comes from love. And then when we learn about this love, then we would have an idea, not just an idea, but then we will, we will know how to love and, 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 and how to live in this love in our own lives as well. So to help us understand about this agape love of God, I'm gonna turn our attention into a beautiful story. And we all know this story of leper, all right? A man who was suffering with leprosy in Mark chapter one, verses 40 to 45. So I would like all of us to read this passage that comes from Mark, Chapter 1, verses 40 to 45, if you have the Bible with you, or if you have the phones, or, or anything that you have in front of you, uh, let, us, let us read these words for ourselves. And the second passage that I want to read, it goes similar, like it goes with this passage, that is from Leviticus, chapter 13, verses 45 to 46. All right? So if you are there, I'm going to read it. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. 
be clean. Immediately leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning, see that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, sow yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news as a result. Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Now the next passage, Leviticus chapter 13, verses 45, 46. Anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes. Now, what does that signify to you? What does that mean? Maybe a sign of shame, right? Torn clothes, sign of shame, right? Let their hair be uncombed. What hair represents? Honor, right? And now as a sign of dishonor, disgrace. And cover the lower part of their face and cry out, unclean, unclean. Now, what does that mean? Self-identify as a sinful person or cannot be touched by anyone. Or he cannot touch anyone either. Now, 46, as long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. What does that mean? Now, he has to be isolated in quarantine for a lifetime, right? This is a lonely place. He had to be lonely. So he would spend his life in loneliness. In loneliness. Now, can you imagine the depth of suffering that this person had to go through? Now, <clears throat> how many of us we know that what is leprosy? How many of you, of you had leprosy? No one. How many? How many of, of us like have like have met people with leprosy? One, two, great. You know, growing up in the in my school time, I used to have a lot of friends from the leprosy colony, in the hospital, and I would go and eat with them. Uh, you know, just at the beginning, it was very hard for me to be with them because I would also feel like so, so scared that I would, I would get the disease. But then later on, like they happened to be the most nicest people in that colony, in the place, like who would offer food, welcome us. And, and it was such a nice, like I had beautiful memories with my friend uh, whose, whose parents were leper. Now, I cannot call it leper, but then was suffering from leprosy disease. Now, the leprosy was a skin disease. Okay, it would spread on to the rest of the body and uh, killing other healthy cells in the body and finally bringing death to your body, right? One thing that you would not feel pain when you, when you touch it. And now imagine the extent of damage that it has done in, in, onto your bodies. You would not know how much it has gone bad, right? Until like it begins rotting out. It begins, you know, like you, you, you will start to lose your limbs, your, your hands and your skins and and it brings that, like, you know, and distorts your, your image, destroys your image as well, like your, your beauty as well, all right? The worst thing is that we've heard that leprosy is such a disease that now you have to be excommunicated from the community. Now, we know that community is essentially is part of our lives. We cannot survive without the community, right? It takes, it says that to raise us higher, it takes a whole community, a whole family, right? Well, what happens for this person that he had to be excommunicated from the community? I mean, like he would be hopeless. Having a, you know, having a dream of having a family would be like futile for him, right? So it's just, it's just useless. So now when, I, <clears throat> when, we, uh, when we heard about this, this story in Mark and how Jesus actually comes to this person and he reaches out to this man, what do you see here? Uh, how Jesus reaches out to this man. And then in light of our, our, our theme of love, and, and what, what do you see here? How Jesus is, is actually then relating to this person, right? One thing that comes to my mind is, is that Jesus in his love is becoming incarnation. You know this word incarnation, right? Incarnate, like Jesus really comes down and he reaches out comes heaven and reaches out. And he, he himself comes down to us and he lives out this sinful life and he heals us from his own life. So that could be a very simple meaning of incarnation. But then 
what do you what I want what I want us to focus is that we can see that in this story that Jesus uh, he shows this incarnational love and we want us to and, and I want us to understand this this incarnational love for ourselves as well now um, now this leprosy disease is also like a sin you know uh, is the way leprosy uh, erodes or destroys your skin and your body sin in our lives also destroys slowly right our our not just our light um our image our 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 life but it finally brings death uh in our lives it, it brings spiritual death in our lives now one thing that sin does is that it mars you know there's a word mars or distorts the image that god given god given image in us now when we think about image what comes to your mind When you think about image, what comes to your mind? Face, person, image, what comes to your mind? Photo. Photo, yes. Now we we when we say like image, uh, we, we we can only think about the photo picture, right? The, the picture of that person. Well, then when I'm, when I'm saying image, it goes beyond that. Uh, a person's being or identity, all right? His personality. Um, or or if, we, if we go deeper, then we can talk about like a person's, uh, you know, like the, the, the whole being, how we are made up, how, you know, what elements that ma makes us as human beings, right? His will, our will, mind, heart, body, soul, spirit, all of these things makes us who we are, right? And, 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 and behind this, there are like, um, there are ideas that makes these images, okay? For an example, like, think about the image, like what image comes out to you when you think about Hong Kong? Like. Harbor. Harbor. Okay, for me, like the financial that building, okay? It's just, center okay the describing buildings and all of that what comes to your mind when you think about hope for all church hope for all church Last reaction, okay. <laughs> okay hope for all church like when you think about like cross okay hope for all church like we have a logo okay logo symbols Logo speaks of who we are. We have different colors in the logo because that logo represents the, the colorful people. We are from multicultural, um, multi-ethnic, uh, multi-ethnic diversity. We have diversity. We have different people coming in together and we're trying to do life together. So this represents our face, our image of who we are as people, people of God, right? So now you can see that behind the image, there is this ideas that form our identity, our image. Like the idea is that how we should look like to become what, right? Now, this same idea, if you apply to yourself, we are living actually by these ideas and we have our own images that we carry in ourselves. That what, you know, like Deepak, person, Deepak Dai should look like, what makes Deepak Dai is, is like he's not just his like outer look, but then his personality, his character, the ideas behind that, even he, he what he thinks about himself. And make the history behind him, the past, the culture around him, the language he speaks, the friends that he has, the food he eats, right? All these things make up, you know, make up to, to, for him to become a person. And that now what we see as an image, as being, as an identity. Now, uh, it's a very, <laughs> it's a complicated thinking, but then that's what we believe actually. We don't really like think through, but then this is what we have back of the mind and this makes us makes us us of who, who we are today now bible talks about this listen to me carefully that the scene mars this image or sin actually brings this distortion or or, or or destroys this image that god given image in us and how is that possible let me just like read a couple of the passages here and then i'm not saying that sin 
somehow somewhere flying comes in and then like it destroys you. Like, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying ideas. All right, you know, sin distorts that that image that God has given to us. Now let me just like first read the passages and then maybe like uh, then unfold some of the things. James 1, 14 to 15. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own ego desire and enticed. And after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Now, another time, Romans 3, 23 says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 10, 12, it says that, it says that none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And if you go on reading in Corinthians, Paul says that the things that I want to do, I cannot do, right? But the, I end up doing things that I don't want to do. So he, he shows that struggle in his will, his willpower. There's something, something controls his willpower. Even though he wants to do better, he wants to be a best person. He wants to be a good person, but then he cannot on his own strength, right? So now you can see that these, in our image, there is this influence of sin and Satan. And God has created us in his image, but then there's the sin, the presence of sin makes us unable to stand before God, or it makes us sinful in the ways that this sin erodes, takes away the beauty that God has given to us. I'm gonna read this Dallas quote, uh, Dallas quote and it just helps us understand this concept. Dallas Willard in his book says that, uh, in renovation of heart, ideas and images can be a stronghold of evil in the human self and society. They determine how we understand the things and events of ordinary life. And they can even blind us to what lies plainly before us. He goes on to say, ideas and images are the primary focus of Satan, Satan's effort to defeat God's purposes with and for humankind. When we are subject to Satan's ideas and images, he can take a holiday. For an example, when Satan came to Eve, he came with an idea that God could not be trusted. So she must act on her own to secure her well-being. Now, does it make sense that how Satan manipulates the idea, all right, the message that or the idea that, that God has given to us, actually. Now, he made us, he created us in his image with free will power to choose, either to choose God or not, either to choose him freely to worship him or to worship ourselves. Now, God has given us that free will power, free will choice. But then now Satan comes and, and brings these ideas and then when we take part in those ideas, then we begin to sin against God. And we then end up disobeying God and go against God's norm or God, go against God's purposes, the good goodwill, his love that he has for us. In that, that sense that there is this, this partnership that we play, the partnership that we have. Sin is not something that holds you and grips you and it makes you like, oh, I cannot do this. Oh, I don't want to do this. But, but there is this partnership that happens. All right, but then... Obviously, there is this like, you know, willpower. We feel powerless against the power of sin. Okay. Now, now, why I am sharing this to you in light of this leprosy story. Let me tell you a story of my own brother. Okay. My own brother struggled with drug, addict, uh, drug addictions for many years. And uh, every year when I went home uh, for vacation, I would... I would share gospel with him, and I would talk good things about what he can become and who he is. But then every time, this is what he would say, that he cannot think the way we think as normal people. Nobody understands him. He cannot be loved. What he is today is what he is. He would die with this, but he cannot be changed. Now, what is wrong in that? And he would, he would not want to accept the gospel, the good news that I wanted to share with him. Why? Because he has perceived this message, these ideas about himself, that he cannot be good, that he has not been loved. God cannot forgive him. He can never overcome these problems in his life. Now, that's what he has believed in his life as, a, as his identity. Now, the ideas have come to him. 
And, and, and Seren obviously has given these ideas to him. Now he always believes in those ideas. He believes out those ideas in Islam, becoming his image. And what appears in the action is like what he believes in his heart. In his heart. Now, because sin and Saturn has marred the view of ourselves, we struggle in understanding our own self and others as well. I'm going to talk about one thing, low view of ourselves. Okay, what is this? I don't feel good enough about myself. Another one, comparison. In comparison, I begin to compare myself with other, other people or compare others to someone. Right? Just like the leprosy disease. Now, another one is collapsed heart, hard heart. In this, I say to myself, just like my brother, I don't deserve this. I cannot be loved. I cannot accept this. I cannot change. Is this idea that Saturn speaks in our mind that we cannot be better in our lives. I can never be better. I can never do better in my life. Right? There is no hope for my life. Now, the worst thing is, is that now we resort to do those things. Like we resort to, to do to, to those things that to satisfy our desire. And many times those desires are harmful or not are sinful or not beneficial, but we do it again. Nevertheless, we do it again, right? And we know that these things are this, whatever you call it, the, the nature of sin is never committed alone. There is always these layers, these layers, right? Whether small or big sins we commit in our lives, it brings guilt, shame, and fear. And then the tricky part is that Saturn never leaves us. And he comes back again and, and, he, and he starts blaming us, saying, see, uh, you have failed again. And you cannot improve in your lives, right? Or, or then when we hear the voices and we begin to actually then do the same thing, we, we begin to shift the blame to someone else. And this, this blaming games goes on and off, on and off, just like in the, the Garden of Eden and in the uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now I'm gonna stop there because we don't have much time. Um, there are lots of those things like distrust, like, like those kind of things. But now, now I want us to focus into this, uh, this message that, that when you look into the story of this person like who was suffering with leprosy, what Jesus does to transform his image, okay? What Jesus does and, and, and how he does that to transform this person's image into his image. Okay, for a normal person, it, it, was, not, it was not possible for to touch a leper because if he would touch him, he would defile himself as well, let alone a leader, rabbi, right? But then what you see here is that Jesus, in his incarnational love, in his love for this person, he touches this person. When the person says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus then immediately what he does, let me think. That's what he says, right? Okay, let me think. Come, come here. Let me pray for you. That's what Jesus says, right? Right? What Jesus does, he reaches out. The word says that he reaches out and he touches him. And he says, I am willing. He reaches out for us and he touches the person. Maybe that person would have been smelling, rotting out. His skin was smelly, rotting out with this disease. Nobody might have him in this way. And now, you know, how shameful he, 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 he would have been like, you know, feeling in, his, in, his, in himself. Now Jesus reaches out to him, touches him and says, I am willing, be clean. That's what Jesus says. Now, I really see that in this, Jesus showing what it really looks like, the love of Heavenly Father. He reaches out to him first. And I believe that to get to this person, Jesus, this was the only way for him to get to this person, by touching his disease, touching his skin, and to get to this person. What happens next is beautiful. Because Jesus leads this guy into a full restoration process, right? Jesus heals this man 
and then tells him to go to the priest. And then after that, offer the right sacrifice, offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded. Now, what that, what that says to you, what that says to you is Jesus is now enabling, but immediately after healing him, he enables him to go to the priest, meaning that now he can meet priest and, and then he not, not only is able to, to meet people around him, but then he's able to offer the sacrifice in the temple, meaning that now he is now being, can be accepted as a, as a local person, as a, as a normal citizen in the society. Now only, and, and only, only because of, only by him doing that, uh, him, him could, only by him doing that, he could be fully restored in his relationship with others in the community as well. So now Jesus enables him by healing him to go into his society back and to be, and he allows him to become a totally a functional person and relatable person, not just him to relate with others, but then others to relate with him as well. Now, this is what it looks like, like when, when Jesus or when God reaches out to us with his love, he fully restores us from our sinfulness and from our sickness, whatever disease that we are carrying in our lives. And I want us to focus more on how Jesus takes this cursed, cursed, or how do you say, cursed symbol, this image of cross upon himself. Just imagine the cross stood for what? Shame, right? Another one? Horror. What cross stood for? before Jesus died on the cross. Cross stood for shame, horror, abandonment, for loneliness, death. Nobody wanted to die in the, on the cross. Now everyone wears the cross, right? <laughs> but nobody would want to wear the cross. There was a sign for horror and shame. Now he identifies himself with it. Jesus identifies himself with this crossed, crossed cross, cross. Okay, he gives his identity as a son of God to our for us so that we can become like him. And he changes this identity, this, this, this symbol of cross to become the symbol of love and redemption. Now to make us clean whole, he takes our sins upon himself. He defiles himself with our sins so that we could be forgiven. We could be healed from our uncleanness. In his incarnational love, unconditional love, he comes to us and touches our sinful heart and makes it anew. He offers us a new self, a new image, a new identity where now we can be identified with God himself and be in that loving relationship with him. God became incarnate in his love for us. We know this word, right? God so loved the world. Can we say that he, that he gave his begotten son? And whosoever believes in him perish, but have eternal life. God so loved the word. The word is actually the word is sarcos. His word is sinful. He gave himself off for the word, the sinful word, and he became himself, he took upon himself our sins. Romans 5:8 it says that, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that beautiful? Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his word. He demonstrates his word, not just words, but he demonstrates his word, his love for us in this way that, that, that you know, while we were sinners, Christ died for us, for each one of us. And this is the love of God, the incarnation of love of God that changes us, that transforms us, and transforms our image uh, to become like God. Just two things. To happen this, there is willingness. None of these things happen just by chance or just by because it has to happen. No, there is always willingness, right? In 40, verse 40, what do you see? If you are willing, there is a person who is in need and crying out, God, Jesus, if you're willing, then you can make it. There is a part of belief and faith that he puts in, all right, from his part, from this, this person who is suffering, he's, he has this, maybe like this small faith or belief, but he has this part. He wants to be healed. He desires to be healed, right? And then there is another response to that. And Jesus says that, yes, I am willing. 
I desire that you be well and, and you be clean, you be restored. And what it shows is that this amazing heart of God, the Heavenly Father, Father's heart that he always wills, he desires us to be well. You know, he wants us to be clean in our lives. He wants us to be whole in our lives. He's willing. He's willing that, 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 that we should be gathered as his children under his arms. We should come back and be reunited with him. He, he wants us to be in a loving relationship with him, not just with him, but to others as well. And it is his will and his desire. And we know that Jesus always does the will of God, right? He always abides. He always wants to do the will of God. And in the will of God, he actually then, then, then he loves people. Now, sometimes it is important for us to also be reminded that, you know, I'm, am I willing to be healed from God? Am I willing? Am I, am I, am I allowing God to heal my life? My life right? Am I willing to be healed in my life? And today, I do not know where you are at, but then God is perhaps inviting you to taste that love. He wants to touch you and not just make you feel better. He wants to touch you, those areas of your heart where sin and Saturn has corrupted, where you are struggling in your life. Maybe the ideas that you have been struggling in your life, that you are not good enough. Maybe the ideas that you struggle, you know, the, the ideas that you have developed in your, in your entirety of your, of your life. You know, the ideas, whatever it is, whatever maybe that is, that is not of God, that is not from God. That identity that you have created within in yourself, that does not come from God. God wants to touch you. God wants to touch the core of your issue. I've met many people now, and we've been telling them God loves you, but it has not been effective so far. Why? Because they have believed in the idea that they are not good enough. They have believed in this ideas that, that just roots, that, that is under, the, under, the, under, under the, that is really under, under grading, that, that is the undergrading factor that is making them who they are. And I want us to look at what is under, what is beneath. What are you believing? What are you thinking? Who do you think who you are? You know, what image comes to your mind when you think about your own image? When you think about yourself, what image comes to your mind? What do you think about yourself? Who am I in this world? And, and to that, I want us to be reminded that God is the one who created you. Amen. The one who loves you so much. God is going to come, come to you and he wants to touch you in those areas. He wants to heal you and make you well and, and, and clean. But you need to allow him to touch you. All right? You need to express that desire. God, I want to be touched by you. The last one, there is a response in that love as well. Okay? That guy had to go where? The temple to the priest. But he went where? He went where? Like, it's crazy. Like, ah, you know, I've been here and all of that. And it's just all obstructed. What Jesus, it just destroyed the plan of Jesus. You know, many times we think like, okay, I'm doing well for God. Or, but that may not be necessarily that, that what God wants us to do. No. What God was precisely asking him, he did not respond that way to Jesus. You know, what God is asking us today, right? To you in order to love someone. How he is asking you to love someone. In Mark, we see that there is this standard of loving someone that, uh, that we read, all of us, we know that, that verse very clearly, that it says that, um, I'm gonna read that one, if we have it on the, on, the, on the screen. And love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. Do we have that one? No. Okay, love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, right? And love your neighbor as yourself, right? So God has actually now, not only loved us with his incarnation of love, but then he wants us to practice that with our neighbors, okay? <laughs> in the same way, in the same way, in an Indian way, in the same way, you know? In the same way, he wants us to practice in the same way, okay? And many times what, we, what happens is that we receive that, but it becomes difficult for us to do that. And, but then when we are willing to do it, and when we do it, it becomes powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna invite Brother Deepak to share his experiences in Down Island, how, what he encounters or what he has experienced uh, when the 
the, you know, serving those brothers in the rehab center. Uh, especially the moments that he, uh, I would love to hear, like share about like during the withdrawal period, like how do you actually treat them? Uh, you can, you may please just share with us uh, to help us understand what this incarnational love really look like in, in reality too. Okay, just one aspect of it. I'm not saying that this has to be this way all the time, okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you very much for letting me speak today. Um, uh, love, loving your neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself is always easier than said than done. Uh, but is it possible? It's absolutely. It's not impossible. It's absolutely possible. But it's just a, you just have to show your will. And that's what we do in a rehab center every day. Um, because in a rehab center, we have this saying that all the drug addicts are love addicts too. <laughs> They're really seeking for the real love. The human touch, the human love, they're missing in their life because they go on looking for all the wrong places and then they find it in the drugs or in other vices. That is not supposed to be the real love. But how we treat them, these people, they come to our rehab, they're ostracized by the society and they're definitely missing out a lot in their life. I have treated this brother, the first time when he arrived, um, we have to give him like a zero size haircut, yeah? And this brother, while I was cutting, his head was full of this thick dandruff, the scalp was, because the grooming, the personal grooming and then the personal hygiene is least of our worries. As a drug addict, there is no place for us. We have no time. So as I was cutting his hair, saving his hair off, the missing jammed actually. Should I be screaming about it? No. No, I didn't wear gloves or nothing. I, I just went ahead. I did it with more care. And that's the first step. And the second step, we have to wash the clothes of the brother. The one way, there is a different ways. Uh, one is to get rid of this, this smell of cigarette. Another one is to get rid of any contraband they might have hide in their pockets. Another one is to show them the real love that they are renewing. They are starting their new life. They are washing away their old life away, and that that water turn into a coffee color water. It's so dirty. Next is like when they are in the withdrawal period. It depends on the choice of their chemical, but usually the heroin is the one that we have to treat the most, and. What happened is like the body aches so much and they have specific places that ache so much that like we have to massage them all the time. And some of the brother, they comes with a prolonged use of injection. They are full of abscesses. The body is rotting. The feet is really scarred everywhere. And we have to massage the specific part, the feet. And the feet is the one that got infected the most by the use of injection. But we do not put on the COVID full gear. No, we do not put even the gloves. We just muscles. And they, some of the brothers have a mental issues. Some of them comes with a paranoid schizophrenia. Some of them have anxiety, some of depression. They have all sort of medical problem conditions they deal with. So you have to talk with them. Am I a trained psychiatric? Psychiatrist? No, I, I'm not. But I can empathize with the brother because I've been to that place before. I was once suicidal. I was in a depression. So the same way I can empathize with the brother. I'm not a physiotherapist, but I know how to massage my brother and I know exactly where it hurts. This comes from the experience. Um, I'm not a trained set, but I know how to cook a bowl of noodles in the odd hour when the kitchen is closed. I have to prepare a soup or noodles for the brother. This is the reciprocating the love. In order to reciprocate the love of Christ Jesus, you have to embrace 
and understand the suffering of your brother and your sister as if it's yourself. As that suffering is yours. Embrace the suffering. In uh, Matthew 24, uh, 25, 35, 36 says, For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. For I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. For I was a stranger, you invited me. For I was sick, you look after me. For I was prisoner, you came and visited me. The disciples asked, like, well, the writers will ask, when that all happened? Well, and this verse, the 2540, the Matthew, is guiding force of my life. I tell you the truth, whatever you do for least of your brother and sister of mine, you did it for me. So whatever, so we're just mirroring the image of Christ Jesus Christ in our life. He gave us, he enabled us to love somebody. Today we're basically recipro reciprocating that love. And this brother eventually go on reciprocating the same love toward others. So this go on, go on, go on. It's a chain system that we're creating in our ministry. And recently this suffering brother accepted one of the brother, Ines, he accepted Christ as a savior through Pastor Epstein. It is only in a because of the love of Christ. Because he saw the reciprocating action from us. He saw the action of disciples, of the love of disciples, and he saw them, and he saw the image of Christ in our love. And he is in Christ today. Thank you very much. What drives you to do what you do? What drives you what, to do what you do today? Is it the love of God? Is it the love of God underneath? Is it something that drives you to do what you do? I want us to ask these questions. Paul E. Miller says that there are plenty of modern lepers, the disabled, the lonely, the mentally ill people. And uh, it, is not, it is not natural that to, to find a lot of people here in the city with all kinds of problems, those with, uh, they're suffering in their lives, depressions and so many things, especially the pandemic and, uh, and the protest have now heightened those problems in their lives. It has, become, it has become difficult for people to come to the church is because uh, many times we wait in the church for people to come in here when the people are suffering out there in the market. They're suffering in the cage houses. They're suffering in the, in the places like where they can feel comfortable. So one of the callings of a disciple is that God calls us to be there where um, people are being hurt. You know, Jesus was there where the people, people were most, most hurt. He was right there in the center. And I believe that as we take this message seriously in our lives, that God is calling us to be in those places. And imagine the depth, imagine the, the power that we can transfer, we can bring in the lives of people through the gospel is, is awesome. You know, it's gonna impact people and it's gonna continually impact them. If we as become disciples of Jesus Christ, carrying this love, that goes beyond our own interests. That goes beyond our own powers to change someone's life. So I want to invite us into this ministry, loving someone with the same love of Christ. Okay? And it is possible. Thank you, Brother Dipa, for sharing that. It is possible for us to do it. And the crisis, suffering, problems, they are the opportunities for us to share the gospel, to act out the gospel in the lives of people. They will allow us to, end. They, they are the gate, they are the entry points that we can enter into the lives of people and be the good news for them. Be the good news for them. Be the good news for them. As I was reflecting, I, I could write only a prayer today that, you know, just, just a prayer, uh, I wish that I can be like this before you, oh God. And I'm going to pray this prayer before you.
all of us. And we will enter into a time of communion after this, reflecting on what God has done for us, and also reflecting upon our own hearts, heart's place before Jesus. And praying, I will allow you to pray your own prayers in response to God's love. And this is my prayer. Lord, it has been difficult for me to love. It has been difficult for me to love, like you do. But here I am. I need you to fill my heart with your unfailing love. Lord, regenerate your love in my life. Lord, I don't feel the peace of your own